Jesus Christ in your heart, we can go anywhere with this melody of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing the second song that we're going to sing. You may sit down if you want, but the next song that we're going to sing reminds me, and I believe this is reminding us, that we are not the one doing salvation, right? It is only the Lord Jesus Christ saves. Missionaries all over the world, you know, they, they go and witness and preach the word of God, preach Jesus Christ, telling that Jesus saves. Amen? So you're going to sing the song, please.
then the men watching and waiting, looking about, filled with his goodness, and they will join together in the chorus. So we do that. We be a cappella. All the leaders, please, ready? Say.
interview with Guy Mason, the lead pastor of City on Hill Church. And regardless of your opinion of how well Guy represented Christians in that interview, it was a very awkward conversation. And I do not know if it actually achieved what Channel 7 were hoping it would. Confrontation can be difficult. Most people do not like doing it. I'm, I'm a bit uneasy about doing it myself. If I, have to, if I have to confront a student on something at school, I'm always like, oh, here we go, do it again. You know, but you know, it's part of the job, I guess, as a teacher. Um, but it can be tough. Confrontation can be difficult. Let me say, if you're going to do it, you need to make sure that you are right in what you are doing and that you are doing it for the best interests of everyone involved. I'm fairly certain that Channel 7 were not looking out for Guy Masons or for anyone associated with the Sydney Hill Church's best interests when they did that interview. Well, the situation that we read about in Galatians 2 verses 11 to 14, which is what I shared with you several months back, Paul was involved in a confrontation and was even the instigator of that confrontation. But he was right regarding the issue that caused him to confront his fellow apostle Peter. Even though it may have initially been an awkward situation, it most definitely was made in the best interest of everyone present. And let me say, Probably everyone who's believed in Christ since. As a way of reminder, the incident happened at the church in Antioch. Peter had travelled up to visit the church there. Initially, he was openly eating with the Gentile believers. For, for some time, he was at the church. But when some men arrived who had been sent by James, who was the leader of the Jerusalem church, Peter began to withdraw himself from the Gentile believers. We're told in verse 12 that he did this because he was fearing those who were of the circumcision. He was motivated by fear of these Jewish believers sent by James. But verse 13 goes on to tell us that his actions also influenced other Jewish Christians in Antioch, including Barnabas. Paul even labels their actions as hypocrisy. He says they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Paul challenges Peter with these words in the second half of verse 14. He says, if you, were being, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? He asks him this question. Now how could something as simple as not eating with certain people distort the truth of the gospel message? Well, in the rest of chapter 2, what we're going to be looking at this morning, Paul explains for us how it can be. It's very important. So far in the book of Galatians, Paul has taken up most of chapters 1 and 2, giving us his personal story. He shared with us his testimony, how he was converted from a hater and persecutor of Christians into one of the Christian faith's strongest and boldest believers who took the good news of Jesus Christ outside of Israel and into the Gentile world. He's also defended his apostolic authority by showing how the gospel message that he began to preach to the Gentiles was consistent with what the other apostles had taught. They came to see that the Lord had appointed him with the special task of sharing Jesus Christ with non-Jewish people. Well, the letter now takes a different turn. In our passage today, we'll see Paul's justification 
for confronting Peter publicly about his wrong conduct. This leads us into the doctrinal section of the letter in chapters 3 and 4, where he will fully expound the doctrine of justification by faith. And if any doctrine is important, this one is really important. Now I've summed up our passage in three words. So if you're a, if you're a note taker here this morning, you might want to take these down. Verses 15 to 18 can be summed up, summed up, I think, with the word justification. Verses 19 to 20 with the word living, and verse 21 with the word grace. It's possible that our passage consists of Paul's actual words that he said to Peter when he confronted him during the occasion mentioned in verses 11 to 14. But that, I guess, is not really that important. Well, let's begin with point one. This is justification. Now look at verse 15 of our passage. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now straight off the bat, Paul initiates, or differentiates, let me say, between the two groups that are involved in this conflict. And he's reminding Peter of what he is. He mentions the Jews who've been given the divine law of Yahweh himself. They're God's chosen people. They are the descendants of Abraham. Then there are the Gentiles, basically everyone else on earth who's not Jewish. All right, which probably pretty much most of us, if not all of us here, this morning. Now Paul's description of Gentiles as sinners is not meant to be taken as a derogatory term or a put down for us Gentiles. Let's not get offended by the fact that he's calling us Gentile sinners. It's not referring to Gentiles in a behavioural sense of, of like public immorality, what they do, uh, their actions, that kind of thing. We often see Jesus in, in the Gospels, for example, describing or described as eating with tax collectors and with sinners. And this is not what Paul means here. In the mind of a, of a Jew, Gentiles were sinners because they had no law to guide them. They had no instructions on how they were to live and how they were to please God. So in that sense, Jewish people saw, and I guess see, Gentiles as sinners. Well, in verse 16, Paul reminds Peter of what he believes. He continues, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Here Paul uses the key word that holds a lot of theological meaning. He uses the word justified. And this word the heart, is, is at the heart of, Christ, of the Christian teaching of justification by faith. The fact that Paul uses it three times in verse 16 shows that it holds great importance with what he is saying in this passage. He even mentions this word a fourth time in verse 17 as well. Three other words are used that are closely related. They are the words works, law, and faith. As we will see, the word faith is linked with justified, and the word works is linked with law. Next, he reminds Peter what the, both of them have done. He says, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. He returned to Peter to the very act that he did on the banks of Galilee all those years ago. When, he, when a mysterious man said to him and his brother Andrew, follow me and I will make you visions of men. On that day, he believed in Jesus. He did not really know that much about him, but he left what he knew. He left his career as a fisherman 
And he followed him and he did it by faith. Paul continues in verse 16 by reminding Peter why they believed. He says that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. In this brief sentence Paul shatters hundreds of years of Jewish tradition. He destroys the very foundation of the Jewish faith human effort. And he establishes the one thing that makes Christianity different from Judaism and all the other religions of the world. And that's faith in Christ. So, what is the Christian doctrine of justification by faith? It's important, so it's worth us understanding what it is. Put, to put it simply, these verses state that a believer is justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. Now, the term justified is often used in the letter to the Galatians in a legal context. And it means to set right, to deem right, or to do a person right. That's the general understanding of it. The spiritual dilemma that all humans face is that we are incapable of overcoming our own sinfulness that separates us from a holy God. Job's friend Bildad addresses this problem when he asks in Job 25 verse 4, how then can a man be just with God? This teaching addresses that dilemma and is essential to the Christian faith. If you don't get this right, you don't really get Christianity. It's what makes Christianity stand out from all the other religions of the world. And it makes it stand out by revealing that salvation is not based on our own effort, but on what Christ has done for us. Of the most important doctrine, Martin Luther wrote this. He says, He hath here no trifling matter, in hand, but the chiefest article of all Christian doctrine. For what is Peter? What is Paul? What is an angel from heaven? What are all other creatures to the article of justification? Which if we know, then we are, we are in clear light. But if we are ignorant thereof, then are we in most miserable darkness. By separating himself from Gentile Christians, Peter was denying this fundamental truth that salvation comes by faith in Christ alone and not adhering to the laws about who we can or cannot associate with as the Jews were doing. He was showing by his actions that salvation from one's sin is not only through faith in Christ but also through keeping the practices of in other words, to become truly saved, you needed to keep all the laws that the Jews were told they needed to keep. This is the same message that the Judaizers, those who were seeking to discredit Paul, were preaching. Now before we go on, I want to address an obvious question here. Were Jews ever instructed in the Bible that they could not associate with Gentiles? Because in the New Testament we're told that's what they did. Well, actually they weren't. They were never told. In anywhere in the Old Testament they were, that they were not to associate with Gentiles. In fact, they were meant to welcome them into their lands. But they did this because of their dietary laws. And this is these, these laws were present in the Old Testament. I mean, in the, when we talk about the matters of idol worship, false gods and that kind of thing. They were meant to distance themselves from that. But in the general sense of just spending time with Gentiles, there was, they could do business with them, they were still allowed to be in their presence. But Gentiles were seen as being careless around food matters. They were a bit haphazard about this in terms of the eyes of a Jew, anyway. 
For example, they would eat pork, um, which Jews were not allowed to eat, and other foods as well that they would eat. And of course, if they would do that, then the Jews would eat them, and they would make themselves unclean. So for this reason, a pious Jew would avoid all contact with Gentiles. They wouldn't go near them. So that they would be able to maintain that ceremonial cleanness and not make themselves unclean. As I shared with you when we looked at the first part of chapter 2, Peter had been shown by the Lord through a vision of these unclean animals in a sheep that came down from heaven that God no longer considered these dietary laws important. <clears throat> Therefore, by extension, they were also now free to be with Gentiles. They didn't have to separate themselves. And this experience led Peter to go to the house of a Gentile, a Gentile Cornelius, where he was able to share Christ with him and he was able to baptize his family. Peter was the human instrument that led to the Gentiles becoming Christians. The thing is though, Jews had been getting this wrong for hundreds of years. They had been separating themselves completely from Gentiles. They thought that by keeping all the 613 laws mentioned in the Old Testament, plus all the other uh, laws and traditions and things that had built up over the centuries, that they would be considered holy and right with God. And this is true with other world religions. Islam, for example, has its five pillars of faith. Hinduism has its karma. And Buddhism has the three jewels. All things or all teachings that have an element of human effort attached to them. When you look into the various cults as well in our world, there is also that, that element of human effort. It's basically, in their eyes, it's up to us to make things right. We're the ones that fix our own situation. We are essentially our own saviors, as they see it. But not with Christianity. As Paul says at the end of verse 16, for by the works of the, of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So in verses 15 and 16, Paul lays out the basic understanding of justification by faith in Christ. In verses 17 and 18, he defends this doctrine from those who would challenge him. Verse 17, he says, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Again, he associates himself with Peter as a Jewish Christian by using the pronoun we. Paul preempts the counter argument to, to what he's just said. If I'm justified by Christ without any human effort on my part, won't that simply encourage me to keep on sinning and to not do what is right? In other words, as one writer put it, if God justifies bad people, what is the point of being good? Can't we do as we like and live as we please? Paul even puts forward the question that if the Judaizers were right in saying that you needed to have faith, in Christ plus good works is Jesus wrong in teaching lies? It's an interesting question. Well, the Lord teaches that food is not what contaminates a person since it bypasses the heart in Mark chapter 7. And in verse 18 and 19 he says, Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and his eliminated thus, purifying all foods. Jesus makes it clear earlier in verse 15 of that passage that what does defile someone is the sin that comes from their heart. He 
He says, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which cannot defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile the man. Again, the Jews have got it wrong. It's not what you eat that makes you sinful. It's what comes out of your heart that makes you now, even the thought of accusing the Lord Jesus of teaching lies and causing others to sin must have made Peter feel sick to his stomach. He must have felt terrible. Paul answers his own question at the end of verse 17. He says, Certainly not. Jesus is not the minister of sin. In fact, I am the sinner. And it continues in verse 18. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If after I've been justified, I still sin, then the fault lies with me, not with Christ. To put it in the context of the situation in Antioch, if after believing and teaching that you are saved, from your sinful state by believing and putting your trust in Christ, and then you return to the legalistic dietary laws and habits of separating from Gentiles, it shows that you are a transgressor, not Christ. Salvation is never a license to do as you please and keep on sinning. Never have it. Paul says similar things to this in some of his other letters. After talking about God's grace abounding more than sin, he begins chapter 6 of Romans with this question. He says, what shall we say then? And shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Same question. In verse 2 he answers it the same way he answers in verse 17 of our passage. Certainly not. And he even adds, he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He repeats a similar question in Romans 6.15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, the same answer, certainly not. Later in Galatians, Paul instructs us away from thinking salvation is a license to keep on sin. In chapter 5, verse 13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, and do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. By willfully and unashamedly continuing to sin, after you have been justified by faith, you make yourself a transgressor. Sadly, that's what a lot of us do. But thanks to God for his salvation. So in verses 15 to 18, we see that Paul's main point is this. Justification by faith in Christ is the only way that true salvation works. No one else makes salvation possible. No other human. Especially yourself. Myself. We can't do it. Your own human effort will not cut it. The irony here is that Peter said this in his speech to the Sanhedrin years earlier. He said this. Describing Jesus as the rejected cornerstone, he says in Acts 4 verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That basically cancels out all who never right? To quote Martin Luther again, I must hearken to the gospel which teaches me, along his old English, not what I ought to do, for that is the proper office of the law, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hath done for me, to wit that he suffered and died to deliver, to deliver me from sin and death. It's all about Jesus. Now that we've had a thorough look at what this passage has to say about justification, let's move on to the second word that summarises our passage, and that is the word living, in verses 19 and 20. 
Paul now moves into explaining the practicality of justification by faith for a believer. He does this by talking about what, is, what it is now like for the believer to live once they are exercising faith in the Lord Jesus and in his death and in his resurrection. The word live appears four times in verses 19 and 20. Twice the number of times that the word law appears. And Paul is probably deliberate in doing that. Verse 19 says, For I through the Lord died to the law that I might live to God. Here we see Paul use the illustration of death to get his point across. He says that he died to the law. But he says that he did this through the law. Paul's talking about two different laws here. I think we need to point that out. He is saying, as he also says in Romans 8 verse 2, that he died to the law of sin and death through the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ. And he did this by accepting God's grace. At the start of Romans 7, Paul uses the illustration of marriage to explain what he means by dying to the law. In verse 1, he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies... She is released from the law of her husband. I'm looking and seeing some wives say the smiles. Good thing. <laughs> no, I don't to say that. I'm not a good thing. <laughs> anyway, um, the point that Paul is trying to make from this illustration is that the death of the husband ends the marriage. And it sets the husband free from the responsibilities of marriage. It also sets the wife free as well, so that she is now free to marry someone else, and so she can't be accused of being an adulteress if she marries someone in her husband's life. Now, the illustration is a bit morbid, somewhat comical, you see, but it gets the point across. I think it really does get that point across. When you die to something, you are free from it. Another famous reformer, I'm quoting the reformers this morning, John Calvin, puts it this way. To die to the law is to renounce it and to be free from its dominion, so that we have no confidence in it, and it does not hold us captive under the yoke of slavery. Now I'm sure those who are married here today, at least I hope so, are not going to say that marriage is like being under the yoke of slavery. But the, the point is that living under the law that Peter was returning to is like being under a yoke of slavery. You are constantly having to do things to, to gain God's acceptance and God's approval. And you've probably always been wondering if you've got God's acceptance and approval. But Paul says that he is now living to God. He has died to the law to live to God. Every believer is now free to do this. We are free to live to God. He continues his explanation in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that voice. I, in fact, I remember just reflecting as I was preparing this uh, message, I remember learning that verse when I was a teenager at summer camp at Crystal Creek, for those of you who were there with me as well. And it's such a succinct summary of what life is now like. For the believer. 
One commentator describes this summary like this. He says, when a person exercises faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is placed in transcendent spiritual union with Christ in the historical event of his death and resurrection, in which the penalty of sin was paid in full. To put it more plainly, when you place your faith in Christ, it is as though you were crucified with him on the cross. Meaning that you, that the you that was going to hell for all eternity, because of your sinfulness, is now dead in a spiritual sense. The old life is finished, it's gone. The physical you, with a new spirit, is now free from sin's penalty and is living with the spirit of the risen Christ inside of you. Inside of you. Paul and all other believers live by faith in the Son of God. We now live having placed our faith in Christ, who out of his love for us willingly died in our place so that we can now live free from the penalty of our sin. In Romans 6, Paul describes this transcendent spiritual union with Christ as being baptised into his death. And verse 4 continues the explanation and challenges us to live in the reality of Christ's presence with us. He says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should be walking in newness of life. Let me ask you here today, are you living in this reality of Christ's presence in you? Are you living by faith in Christ? Are you trusting in his love for you and what he did for you on the cross? If, if not, I'm sure there's plenty here that will be willing to sit down with you and tell you how you can. So we see justification in verses 15 to 18. We see living in verses 19 and 20. Then we come to our final point. No doubt, with the church with a name like yours, we appreciate this one. This is grace. Chapter 2 of Galatians ends with this verse. It says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Another version, version translates it this way. It says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Paul finishes his correction of Peter's bad actions by preempting a question that people might ask, about the doctrine of justification by faith. He makes it clear that he is not ignoring God's grace in trusting in Christ for salvation. Grace is still very important for Paul. He believes that righteousness comes to the believer through God's grace, not through the keeping of the law. Now let me first point out that because of our sin, we are not righteous before God. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Paul gets this from verses 3 of both Psalms 14 and 53. He's not actually making this up. It's, it's actually in the Old Testament. It's been in the Bible all this time. He's just repeating it. Our sin makes us unholy before God. Now because God is holy, we need His righteousness to be made holy and to be able to communicate and have a right relationship with Him. Paul is rightly defining God's grace as God's unmerited and undeserved favor. Grace is the delivery mechanism through which a person receives God's righteousness. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest anyone should boast. When a person exercises faith, God then gives them His grace by which that individual obtains God's righteousness. Now because of our sin, we are undeserving of God's grace, but He offers it to us freely. That's the amazing thing about it. Through Jesus, we receive that grace simply because of God's grace. The reason why Paul believes this is because God's righteousness is obtained. Well, the, the, the reason why, sorry, Paul believes this is because if God's righteousness is obtained by keeping the law, then there's no need for Jesus to die. And he did it in vain. He did it when he didn't need to. The gospel message would serve no purpose if we could work to earn our salvation. There's no need to preach it. The English theologian John Stott explains the two foundation plans of the Christian religion are the grace of God and the death of Christ. The Christian gospel is the gospel of the grace of God. The Christian faith is the faith of Christ crucified. So if anybody insists that justification is by works and that he can earn his salvation by his own efforts, he is undermining the foundations of the Christian faith. By thinking that you can earn your salvation by your own efforts, you are actually refusing God's grace. You are saying, God, I don't need your grace. I can do this. Christ's death and God's grace and no longer necessary in your in your life. You don't need it. By separating himself from the Gentile believers, Peter was agreeing with the Judaizers and putting himself against Christ. He was making himself an enemy of Christ. He was doing the same as he did when he rebuked Jesus for saying that he needed to suffer, be killed, and raised. On the third day in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus' response to Peter when he said that was get behind me, he said. For a straw. Well, let me say too, as, as we wrap up this morning, the thinking of the Judaizers is still around today. It's still present in the world, it hasn't gone. And I think we need to be aware of it and point it out to people when we come across it. One example of its existence is actually in Catholic doctrine. Uh, Catholic doctrine teaches that justification by faith is a combination of God's grace and human effort. Is that both working together, which is pretty much what we see here in our passage today. And this is not what the Bible teaches. I want to stress that. Like, I don't want to, use, don't want to present this as an opportunity to like, blast Catholics and tell them to go to hell and be really angry and mean about it. But let's, let's be gracious. If you do know Catholics, maybe just graciously point them to the truth. Let me say, God's grace is amazing. And I love the name. I love the fact that it's in the name. Church. It's a good reminder. When you seriously meditate on it, it should cause your heart to rejoice at what Christ has done for you. I want to encourage you to be thankful that justification by faith shows God's grace to us. So as we wrap up today, what we've seen in Galatians 2, verses 15 and 21 is that the true gospel teaches justification by faith and living in Christ enabled by God's grace. We've looked at some really deep theological points this morning. So I hope the deepness hasn't confused you. And I trust that we will believe this and that we will live in the hope of this wonderful truth in the months and the weeks. Let's uh, close a prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning, Lord, for the, the wonderful teaching that we find in your word on justification by faith in Christ alone. Lord, it, it, it takes away the burden, it takes away the stress, it takes away the struggle to try and please you, to try and earn our salvation ourselves. And Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, help us to really be thankful that Christ has truly done it all. That his death, his burial, and his resurrection and has earned salvation for those who believe in him. So Lord, help us to really cherish that and to, to be willing to share that truth, that wonderful truth with others. We pray in Jesus' name.
Um, also, general meeting is next Sunday. So in that general meeting, there's uh, quite a few new members that are kind of come on board, which is very exciting. Thank you for those. So that's uh, fantastic news. Um, also next Sunday, there's a lot of things next Sunday, so be here. Uh, testimonies, four people are going to do their testimonies next Sunday. That's a, a real blessing. Thank the Lord for that. Um, and that's about it. Pastor, is there anything else you want to add? And sing for birth. There's a birthday. Joel, brother Joel, your birthday. Happy birthday. Can you come to the front? It's a big one. Come, come to the front. We'll sing for you. you know. Thank you.